Well, good afternoon uh, from Singapore, everyone, um, or good morning or good evening, depending on where you're joining from. Uh, my name is uh, Arif Jamal. I'm an associate professor and uh, vice dean of graduate studies here at the Faculty of Law at the National University of Singapore or uh, NUS Law. And I have the honor today of being the moderator for this virtual roundtable on Asian law organized and hosted by the Center for Asian Legal Studies or CALS at NUS Law. Uh, this roundtable is a discussion of the book, Religious Offenses in Common Law Asia, which was published by Hart in 2020, 2021. And that I am proud to say was compiled and co-edited by my colleagues at NUS Law, Professor Tio Lian and Associate Professor Jacqueline Neo. So first of all, Lian and Jacqueline, congratulations on the book. Uh, before we begin the round table proper, uh, please let me cover a few preliminaries. Uh, first of all, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome and to briefly introduce our panelists. In addition to the book's co-editors, well, whom I have just mentioned, we also have with us Professor Neville Cox from Trinity College Dublin, Professor Adrian Stone from the University of Melbourne, and Professor Patrick Whale from the University of Paris 1, uh, Paris 1, Pantheon Sorbonne. We also have some of the authors of chapters of the books here, including Professor Anne Black from the University of Queensland, Queensland, Dr. Mario Gomez from the International Center for Ethnic Studies in Sri Lanka, Dr. Dian Shah from NUS Law, and Professor Masum Bila from Jagannath University in Dhaka. So thank you all for participating in today's roundtable. Uh, in terms of the order of events, we will start with an introduction to the book uh, from Professor Theo Lian, and then we will have three commentaries on the book by Professors Cox, Stone, and Weil in that order, and then a short response to the commentaries uh, by Professor Neo. Uh, thereafter, the floor, the virtual floor that is, will be open for questions and discussions, uh, which I will moderate, directing the questions and inviting panelists to reply as appropriate. Please note uh, that we are using the Zoom webinar format for this roundtable, not the Zoom meeting format. So for participants, uh, while you will not see yourselves appear, you can interact by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to pose questions. Okay, I think that's all uh, from me by way of preface. So let me invite uh, Theo Lian to get us started on the substance of the roundtable with her introduction to the book. Lian, please. Thank you very much, Arif. Can you hear me? Okay, right. So um, as uh, Arif pointed out, the book was published in 2021, one year ago, uh, but its genesis really was in a conference that we held at NUS in December of 2018, which honestly seems like a lifetime away because so much has happened since then. But nonetheless, I'm, I'm very happy, you know, books are, you know, uh, <laughs> the product of thinking, blood, sweat and tears. So it's always important to uh, celebrate a book. Um, and uh, if you look at the book that we have, uh, we uh, tried to, it was really divided into two parts. The first part, of course, deals with the history and the theory and the concept of uh, religious offenses. And the second part uh, has uh, seven very wonderful, rich uh, country studies. Uh, we were concerned not only to look at the idea of uh, this great British colonial heritage, but to also see um, the kind of like path that it had taken in various different countries, because you're dealing with a range of countries, even though we're all common law jurisdictions, something from an a, a Islamic a Malay a monarchy to uh, secular democracies, uh, to countries which uh, have con confessional constitutions. Um, the, but the real origin of this, I mean, before I actually had a chat with Jacqueline about this, was actually when I was at a conference in 2017 in Bailan. And I was actually talking um, to a Russian person, telling him about uh, the religious feelings law in Singapore. And he told me that Russia had one as well. So that I was pretty intrigued. And of course, you, you would know that he's referring to uh, the, Russian, uh, the religious feelings laws that was uh, strengthened in the aftermath of the Pussy Riot uh, performance at uh, the Christ the Savior Cathedral in Moscow in 2012. Uh, Israel also has its own version. So our hope has always been that while we are presenting a, a detailed focus on Asia, at least common law Asia, that this book would always have legs to travel uh, comparatively. And, and so we're very pleased that the Center of Asian Legal Studies uh, is hosting it. So 
what is this idea of religious offenses? Um, it's actually, uh, there are a range of offenses. It could include anything from uh, disrupting a religious assembly uh, to desecrating a grave, uh, to saying something which causes re religious insult or religious wounding. And I've always been really interested about how law interacts with feelings, because as a common lawyer, we're very used to the idea of a rational person, right? And the predictability of a rational person. And in, in a sense, when you talk about religion, it's often stereotyped or cast as the opposite of rationality, right? It's supposed to be about passion. Uh, it's about uh, sensitivity rather than sensibility, if you like. And the origins, of course, of religious offenses, uh, you can find its genetic roots in blasphemy laws. But I suppose one point of clear departure is that while blasphemy laws seek to, in a sense, uh, protect a certain faith, uh, or at least the feelings of uh, the, religious, uh, the members of a particular religious group, religious offenses law were, in a sense, religion neutral, in the sense that they sought to protect the religious feelings of all religions, because it really uh, denoted a shift from, I suppose, blasphemy law, her laws about heresy, to uh, laws about civility, about uh, public order concerns. Because as far as Asia is concerned, uh, religion was never peripheral. Religion never left the house. And there was always the fear that uh, religious tensions would uh, pose public disorder threats. So when we see uh, how this offense was first introduced into the 18, 1860 Indian Penal Code, which of course was very influential uh, to the rest of the common law jurisdictions, uh, the intent then was not to import an English blasphemy law. The intent of Macaulay as he drafted it was to actually uh, deal with the problems that interreligious tensions might pose to social cohesion. So his concern primarily was to ensure a, a fair latitude of religious discussion, which shows some concern for free speech and conscience in the pre-rights era, but also to ensure there was no gratuitous insulting of other religions, which could cause, I suppose, people to uh, uh, react very negatively when uh, uh, the, the feelings towards the sacred uh, was disrupted. So uh, as, as, uh, as far as uh, what a religious offense might be, I'd just like to point out first and all, it's a very vague conception and it could include a, a large variety of events. So I thought it'd be uh, interesting to give you some examples. In Singapore, for example, religious offenses, uh, feelings have been offended when someone put a, a parody of a halal logo and put a pig's head next to that on his website. In the Philippines, uh, there was a disruption of a Catholic uh, uh, service in the Manila Cathedral, where someone came in holding a sign, basically criticizing uh, the church for uh, its stance on reproductive rights. In Nepal, uh, certain uh, people were arrested for uh, preaching Christianity and allegedly attempting to secure converts. And this act was seen to hurt religious uh, sentiments. Uh, in Malaysia and Indonesia, there are instances where, where uh, if, if an Ahmadiyya claimed to be a Muslim, uh, quite contrary to the mainstream view, uh, this would be seen to be a, 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 a cause for religious wounding or insult. Uh, in Russia, uh, there was a case where playing Pokemon Go on the smartphone in church was considered to be insulting. If you are atheist, woe betide you if you post there is no God online, that can also be religiously insulting. And uh, one last example from Austria uh, and uh, uh, the case of ES versus Austria 2018, uh, uh, someone was uh, held uh, to have violated section 188 of the Austrian criminal code for saying in, in a seminar that uh, the prophet Muhammad was a pedophile because he, was in, he had a child bride. So all these are instances of, of uh, religious feelings or religious insult. I think it's very clear too that you can see how in an age of rights, this would interact uh, with um, uh, freedom of religion, uh, freedom of expression, as well as uh, I suppose uh, uh, how states treat uh, uh, all these individual religions. Uh, it's interesting too, if you contrast this with a, a typical liberal defense of free speech, like Dworkin for example said, that uh, in a democracy, no one, however powerful and important, has a right not to be insulted or offended. Nowadays, we talk about, is there a right to, be religious, to not be religiously offended? And if we have such a right, how are we going to conceptualize it? Is it in fact a right? Is it uh, a competing right? Is it part of the public good? Uh, and obviously, you can see that truth can offend. And so for me, uh, much of the time, uh, this tends to boils down into what you prize more. 
whether you price civil peace more, which is the ostensible purpose of these laws, or whether uh, the search for religious truth uh, is important. Because you can think about it, if in the act of evangelism, you say my religion is true and yours is not, if that's considered to be an offense or a wounding, then you would reduce the right of religious free speech to almost nothing, right? So all, all these countries, we have, have to, of course, balance uh, these, these conceptions. Uh, I'll just talk a little bit about um, how uh, it has developed in, uh, ever since it's been imported. Uh, in some countries, uh, it seems to have uh, fallen by the wayside. Uh, it doesn't seem to be very central. It seems to be just one law among many to deal with uh, maintaining religious harmony. I think you can see this from Mario Gomez's chapter and to some extent Dian Shah's uh, chapter as well. In other countries, uh, it's been retained, uh, renovated, uh, repurposed. Uh, in the context of a country like Singapore, for example, uh, we, we, have, we, had a, we had these offences in our penal code, but they have since been imported into a kind of an omnibus maintenance of religious harmony act. But uh, it is still active. The last time anyone was charged with um, hurting religious free, uh, feelings was in January of 2022, right, which is just two months ago. In a country like Brunei, as you can see from Anne Black's chapter, you'll see that uh, she argues that there's an increasing irrelevance of religious penal clauses uh, because of a shift. It, it has a dual system, but there's a greater shift now towards Sharia law. So that tends to be uh, dealing with that kind of thing uh, with implications for both Muslims uh, and non-Muslims. In, in a country like Pakistan, you can see that there has been an enlargement of these religious offenses. Um, uh, for example, there have been new offenses about uh, using certain holy names. And if you use it wrongly, or if you are not seen to be entitled to use it, that also can be a religious offense. So Jack and Neil's chapter talks about some of the factors as to why what are pretty much similar clauses seem to have uh, taken on a different life. She points out the importance of constitutional relationships between religion and state. And I think also very importantly, the factor of strong religion the extent to which there is a dominant religion, and also that particular religion's attitude towards religious freedom. And I think Arif's chapter brings this out very well, that there is a plurality within a religion, that it's not monolithic. So I won't say anything anymore, uh, but uh, my, just the last point uh, for me, uh, the, uh, what is interesting to me is the idea of the fact that these laws in relating to feelings presuppose that its, its object uh, tends to be very, very emotional. Compared to the rational man who is very deliberate and objective and rational, the emotional man here, the religious man, is uh, very much easily uh, given uh, to, to, to upset. So the question really is this, if you are going to be protecting hurt religious feelings, are there any expectations that when your religion is insulted, uh, that you should develop some degree of tolerance and resilience? in the interest of free speech. In other words, is free speech still seen to be a common good or uh, is religion so closely affiliated to your personal and corporate identity that there should be no tolerance of any critique? And of course, if, uh, if you immunize any philosophy or any religion from critique, uh, you pretty much destroy free speech and have negative impacts on democracy. So I'll just stop here and uh, hand it over to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Leanne, for that introduction to the project and, and introduction to the book. Let me turn to the first of our commentators, uh, uh, Neville Cox, please. Thank you very much. And, and from Ireland, good morning to you all on our, our national uh, feast day, which is today. Um, I find that the, the topic of the book absolutely fascinating because I've been working for a couple of decades looking at the question of the interplay between uh, individual rights and as it were religious sensitivities and what i find really interesting about this is that i'm increasingly unable to whereas i can fully understand a state having uh, religious concerns as a priority for its law uh, or for its laws, whether in the area of blasphemy, and I'm going to talk uh, momentarily about the Irish position on this issue, but whether in relation to blasphemy or in relation to uh, religious values generally, I can fully understand um, states having those as priorities within their law. But what I find it difficult to, to rationalize is how this is connected to individual sensitivities. Because it seems to me that <clears throat> 
there are going to be contexts in which individual states will and we take the issue of free speech, which is, I suppose, what's been primarily discussed here, where states will restrict free speech, having regard to what is said. Um, the United States is an obvious outlier, but throughout Europe, there are various examples of states restricting free speech because of what's said, whether it's denying the Holocaust in Germany, whether it's hate speech laws or whatever. Um, and typically, I think this is because of consequences that go beyond an individual being offended, um, <clears throat> whether it is to uh, establish certain ground rules for what is morally acceptable within the state. Uh, and I think that probably is the case, that um, words are symbolic and speech is symbolic. And therefore, by saying that certain words or certain speech cannot be said, you give a very clear symbolic statement as to the ground rules for what is morally acceptable and morally unacceptable generally within the state. So if we take, for instance, and I suppose this is probably true in Europe at the moment, the most unsayable word would be the epithet, the N word uh, epithet. Um, I don't believe that the social and occasionally legal controls on the saying of that word are necessarily to stop people being offended. I think it's a state symbolically drawing lines in the sand and saying that certain kinds of behavior, thought and speech are just morally unacceptable insofar as the state is concerned. It crosses the line. And in doing so, the state uh, almost quasi parentally is saying to its citizens, here is the difference between right and wrong. Now, this is where I think religion becomes extremely important, because if a state uh, endorses religious values as the basis for its moral zeitgeist, then it seems to me to be logical that it would draw those lines in the, stand, in the sand uh, and say that certain kinds of behavior or speech are, as it were, off, uh, off uh, the table because uh, it is so morally unacceptable so far as the state is concerned. And bearing in mind the proposition that states and societies tend to require some measure of moral agreement uh, on the essentials of morality in, in order to function. Because of the contemporary uh, global concern with rights language, um, this seems like, I think, an unfashionable proposition. And so what tended to happen is, in my view, societies have recast the overall societal moral concern within the language of individual rights and the concept of the individual not being uh, offended. So, in other words, the proposition that something is unacceptable insofar as society is concerned becomes the proposition that something is unacceptable because it tramples on individual sensitivities. Now, this very much, I think, uh, represents the evolution of the common law offense of blasphemy. So <clears throat> obviously this, this kind of sprung up within the uh, English judicial system. Uh, and for centuries, until the very late 19th century, blasphemy laws existed and were grounded in the proposition that the Anglican uh, Christian church was part of the law of the land and part of the fabric of the state. And therefore, at that stage, uh, first of all, uh, it, the crime of blasphemy could be committed simply by denying the truth of Anglican doctrine. And secondly, uh, the crime of blasphemy could not be committed if you targeted any other religious faith, faith rather, other than Anglicanism, be it Roman Catholicism or Islam or Judaism or whatever. But in the late 19th century, that proposition had become unsustainable because of the birth of liberalism uh, within the United Kingdom's societal uh, um, ken. Uh, and as a result, blasphemy laws were recalibrated uh, as being something which um, were justified in the basis of the need to protect individuals from being offended in respect to their sensibilities. Uh, but that isn't properly a blasphemy law. That would be a law which protects individuals in respect to their sensitivities. A, a properly grounded blasphemy law is one which says the speech is unacceptable, not because individuals are offended by it, but simply by virtue of the fact that it's blasphemous. And the problem for most European jurisdictions and most uh, Western jurisdictions is that because they have moved 
from society, it's his public morality is grounded on, um, as it were, Judeo-Christian religious values to societies which are proudly and increasingly emphatically secular. The concept of saying we're going to draw lines in the sand in terms of moral acceptability that are based on religion is simply impossible. Um, and therefore the idea of religious penal offences uh, throughout Europe, for example, uh, being either on the statute books or more importantly enforced is simply something which is almost self-evidently uh, unacceptable insofar as these jurisdictions are concerned. Now, my home jurisdiction of Ireland is an interesting one because it's late to the table in this regard. Um, Ireland, um, for those of you who don't know, had secured uh, independence from uh, virtually uh, 800 years of uh, British imperial rule in the early 20th century. And the relationship between Ireland and England was an interesting one because Ireland was predominantly Roman Catholic. Britain obviously was predominantly Protestant and therefore British imperialism was connected also with the suppression of the Roman Catholic faith. And therefore when Ireland became independent, uh, the values uh, of independence were also caught up with the emphasis on Roman Catholic doctrine, because as it were, the people became independent and they also became religiously independent. And so therefore, when the Irish constitution was constructed in 1937, um, Ireland was overwhelmingly and very doctrinally Roman Catholic. It was very much, it was close to being a theocracy. Uh, and when the Irish constitution was written in 1937, uh, this was very much with one eye and, and one ear on what was happening in the Vatican. And the, the Vatican and the Pope certainly played an impact into the construction of the Irish constitution. And so very unusually, there was a crime in the Irish constitution when it was first written, and it, obviously it's unusual to find specific crimes in national constitutions. And it wasn't the crime of murder or the crime of rape, it was the crime of blasphemy. It was the one crime in the Irish constitution. And I think this was understandable back in those days. The then uh, prime minister of Ireland, uh, who was a liberal Democrat, took the view that if this represents the values of the state, then so be it. If the people wanted free speech, to be limited where blasphemy is concerned, then they should be reflected in the constitution. But what's really interesting, I think, is that this state of affairs continued for maybe the first 70 years of Ireland's independence. But at the end, to, towards the end of the 20, uh, 20, um, 20th century, there was a revolution, a kind of bloodless and um, social revolution in Ireland, <clears throat> where Ireland moved very quickly from, as I said, decades of Roman Catholic confessionalism to a most uh, emphatic and, and very strident uh, liberal secularism. It happened in about five years. Uh, and in that, and it happened for various reasons which need to concern us. But since that point, uh, Ireland can no longer be regarded as anything other than secular, whereas it still has a large um, percentage of the population will be practicing Roman Catholics. Nonetheless, in terms of its social outlook, it has become, I think, quite dogmatically anti-religious. And therefore, unsurprisingly, the blasphemy laws became a focus of criticism and were uh, eventually removed from the statute books uh, in 2018. But, but I don't think that either state of affairs was particularly surprising. Back in the mid-20th mid century, Irish public morality, and therefore the rules on right and wrong, were dominated by religion. And therefore there were going to be penal offences which focused on religion because they were simply enforcing the terms of an important element of public morality. They were, as I said, drawing lines in the sand so that there could be clear societal identification of the differences between right and wrong. In the uh, early years of the 21st century, Ireland's uh, public morality was grounded, like most Western democracies, on a concern with equality, particularly gender equality, particularly sexual, sexual equality, and particularly racial equality, and also very much in the language of individual rights. Therefore, the current rules of public morality have nothing to do with religion and everything to do with those other ideological sources. And therefore, where lines in the sand are going to be drawn, they're going to be drawn in relation to speech, which is racist, uh, 
uh, or a speech which perhaps injures people in respect of, for example, their sexual identity. But in both cases, the same thing has happened. In both cases, a society is using words as symbols to express its public moral vision and is drawing lines in the sand to indicate in symbolic fashion to its people where the difference between right and wrong for the purposes of that society are concerned. What I find much more difficult to comprehend is the approach of the United Nations to this issue, and particularly in its general comments in 22 and 34, in which in effect, they first of all say that a single religious vision cannot form a nation's public morality. And secondly, where they say the blasphemy laws, for example, are inherently repugnant to free speech. Because it seems to me that what's happening there is not so much the focusing on particular laws, but rather it's focusing on the question of where a society can ground its public moral vision, and therefore logically, where the lines in the sand are going to be drawn. To my mind, that's a much more difficult proposition to identify, and I find it, in conclusion, very difficult to see why a genuinely international uh, body like the United Nations should be so localised in its views of what is acceptable insofar as morality is concerned. So those are just a few quick thoughts, and I'll, I'll hand it back. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Neville. Um, our next uh, commentator is uh, Adrian Stone. So Adrian, uh, over to you, please. Thanks very much, Arif. I should tell you, I've just been having some internet problems. I do hope that I'm not suddenly going to be thrown off the call. And if I am, I will be back as soon as I possibly can. Uh, but let me begin by thanking uh, the editors and contributors of this wonderful volume. Um, it's a really fascinating and multifaceted account of the history and nature of religious offences in common law Asia. Um, and the story it tells of how religious offences found uh, derived from the Indian penal code have been transplanted and transformed through common law Asia is, is a picture of richness and detail and a case study of transplantation of the likes that I think is, is quite rare. So my, my warmest congratulations. Um, I am interested in two, what I take to be two major themes um, running through the book. Um, and I want to identify what they are. And then I have just really a few brief questions um, for um, the editors uh, as to how they might develop these themes further. Um, one theme is the nature of religious offence laws. Um, and I have to say, I find the book exceptionally useful in the way it delineates multiple understandings of the way in which religious offences can work. Um, I found the identification of, um, of the distinctions drawn between offences against God, offences against religious believers and laws that um, address the denigration or defamation of religion um, uh, to be very useful, and also the distinction between laws that have a dignitarian caste and that those that have a more instrumental caste aimed at the promotion of um, social harmony. I also found it very useful and interesting how the uh, collection, um, in particular in the first, uh, a number of the first four chapters, uh, shows the tension between um, religious offence laws and more modern conceptions of constitutional and human rights, uh, given that religious offence laws are prima facie infringements of some traditional rights, um, and also the way in which they bring into tension the idea of the subject of protection of rights, um, uh, given that they're aimed ostensibly at, at groups rather than individuals. So those that set of issue around the nature of religious offences uh, their multiple conception and their relationships to rights is one major theme. The other one is, of course, transplant and adaptation. Um, the uh, Indian Penal Code was itself a colonial law. And what you see is a law that was in one sense a transplant itself, as I understand it, transplanted and adapted. And then there were transplantations and adaptations um, further and further. Um, uh, and you see the laws modified and expanded. It's a very rich account. Um, a key feature of the laws, however, that a number of the chapters pull out is that the um, laws were never mentioned to, meant to function 
as blasphemy laws in the true sense, but rather as public order laws. So I found my, I mean, and this was in response to the religious diversity of Asia, in particular initially of India. And I actually found myself wondering if this is one of the earliest instances of British colonial law adapting to, attempting to adapt to diversity. Um, and I think a comparison with other colonial contexts uh, beyond Asia would be exceptionally interesting in this regard. So there's a sense in which the laws presaged a more modern understanding of the role of law in a complex multicultural society and had the potential um, to move um, the law beyond the traditional conception of the comparative value of speech and offence. But the story is also sobering and as uh, I think is shown in the introduction, um, the way and in Jacqueline Neo's chapter, the way in fact religious offence laws have been used to consolidate um, uh, state power, shore up elite power, um, and also provide a site for political theatre, a particularly dark side of the expressive value of such laws um, should um, uh, give us some pause about the truly pro progressive potential of the laws. So let me draw out, um, so that's what I think are, are the really big contributions of this book. Um, and I would hope to see both of them, um, if I may be so bold as to make a suggestion to the editors, you know, developed in, a, in comparative context beyond this, because I think that you've developed a set of analytical tools that would be really useful in comparative constitutional law generally. But let me just say this. Um, I have a couple of questions to make on uh, Leanne Teo's excellent chapter, which urges a shift from concern with religious feelings to a concern to a conception of religious freedom as a human right. And that shift leads to greater value placed on truth seeking aspects um, over uh, the protection of religious freedom and makes less space uh, for the protection from offence. I think, you know, overall, I'm very much in agreement. Um, with uh, this line of thought, I just wondered, um, and perhaps I've not fully understood, fully appreciated the subtlety of the of the chapter, but I wonder if the distinction between protecting religious offence and prote which protects the sense of sensibility and freedom of speech, which promotes the rational, is too tightly drawn. In particular, I think the protection of freedom of speech can be understood to have an affect and emotional aspect as well. There is a tradition of writing about freedom of speech in which it culcates characteristics that are not exactly intellectual, such as good character, tolerance and courage. So uh, rights can promote non-intellectual, non-rational characteristics, maybe but, but valuable ones. And commitment to them can also be deeply emotional. And I think some of the writing you see in apex courts around the world has um, seeks to achieve commitment to rights through appeals to emotion. And there are even appeals to identity within them so that you know, what it means to be American might be bound up with your conception of uh, your commitment to freedom of speech. And perhaps what it means to be German could be bound up with a conception of a commitment to perhaps dignity in the basic law. Um, uh, whether I've got the details of those right, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think there are at least some traditions that um, uh, appeal to emotion um, as ways both of, um, of um, promoting commitments to rights, but also um, uh, understand rights to have um, important affective roles. So I, I would love to see that aspect of the work, if you agree with that analysis, I mean, brought out even more strongly, because I think um, it would greatly, um, would deepen even further your very interesting chapter. Now, in uh, I, Jacqueline Neo's chapter, which really focuses on the second theme that I, I found so interesting, um, uh, she shows, um, as I understand it, very compellingly, how the connection of these laws to a public order conception has rendered them vulnerable to certain kinds of manipulation in the interests of the state. That's what I understood the chapter to be, and she identifies three factors that um, uh, I, that uh, help, um, that indicate that such um, manipulation is likely uh, to occur. So my question, just thinking more broadly and, and looking to a global perspective is, this very intensely and beautifully drawn story of comparison and transplantation, how does it relate to the theory of transplantation? It, as I read it, I wondered whether it shows that much in current theory of transplantation underestimates 
the the effect that transplant the the shape of transplanted laws has on their continuing operation, so that there is a tendency to think of them as um, to use a well known analogy from Frankenberg the flat packed IKEA furniture, which can sort of be assembled and adapted to any use. Yet your analysis, I think, shows that they come with an inbuilt structure that although it doesn't fully determine their shape, very powerfully affects it. Um, and I would love to see this work developed as a reflection back on that theory. Um, now, I might have got it the wrong way around. Maybe, um, maybe you think the theory shows that um, uh, bears out the sort of Frankenberg line um, I'm not entirely sure which way it goes, um, but precisely because I think transplantation is a global phenomenon and transplantation in a colonial context is a global phenomenon. I think this very well rendered case study yields some opportunities to develop a, a more general theory of transplantation and I would very much look forward to seeing that work. Um, apart from that, let me just lend my congratulations to everybody involved in this um, uh, volume and say that of the chapters that I didn't mention, I learnt so much from each of them. It was a thorough and thoroughly enjoyable education. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adrian. Um, let me turn now to uh, the last of our uh, commentaries uh, from Professor Patrick. Well, Patrick, please. Hello, everybody, and congratulations for a very important book, in my view, because this, uh, this domain uh, has been under-researched uh, in the West. Uh, it used to be a, a, a very well-researched issue uh, at the turning, at the beginning of the 20th century. And I will uh, focus on the, um, the tradition of my country, France, that has been totally forgotten for one century uh, until I revisited it last year in a book that uh, had a big impact uh, on the debate, which is very harsh in my country, as you might sometimes know, uh, on laicite and on uh, free speech. So let me start by saying that in the French tradition, for historical reason, there is a big distinction made between speech and respect of uh, religious freedom. And it comes for uh, an event that occurred in uh, 1766, the torture and the beheading of a young man of 19 years old who was accused wrongly of blasphema by a court, because blasphema was a criminal uh, act uh, under the Kingdom of France. And this, there was a cross who fall from a bridge uh, during a night of tempest. The church and the state look for uh, uh, the, uh, the guilty, the, uh, the, 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 the actors of this, the people who had done this act, they found nobody they find youth who has drunk too much and has vomited uh, along tombs in a cemetery or who didn't pay respect to a procession. And this young man had his, uh, was condemned to have his uh, bones broken, his head cut, and then his body was burned with on his body the, the philosophical dictionary of Voltaire. And Voltaire reacted by a book, a short book he published a few years later, and he divided this horrible condemnation, created a so big shock among the Catholic believers of the country that one of the first acts at the moment of the French, the beginning of the French Revolution, was to uh, abolish the blasphema law in the declaration of 1789 on the right of man and citizen. And that abolition was confirmed in the penal code of 1791. Since, however, you had some change in the law, and in the 60s, in the 70s, 
was a reason the issue of racist, anti-Semitic uh, 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 speeches against human beings. And since then, the law distinguished between the critics of the attacks on religious ideas or on religion uh, uh, and distinguished from attack on, on religious persons. Uh, the court has made this distinction, has asked to apply this distinction, and it is why, uh, uh, for example, uh, the, uh, the newspaper Charlie Hebdo, who was sent to court for caricature of uh, the prophet Mohammed, was not condemned by the court because it was a caricature of religious figures, as other caricature of Christian figures or Jewish figures has been done by other newspapers. But if you attack Muslims, or Jews or Christian as such, then the court will condemn you. So in terms of speech, I would say there is a right of disrespect since the beginning of the French Revolution. Now it's very different when you consider the issue of religious practice, uh, religious liberty, and after a long period of secularization, the rule was set in the law of separation that was passed under the regime of laïcité uh, in 1905. What is interesting is laïcité in a French context means uh, respect of freedom of conscience and freedom of religion, and also separation uh, between state and church. It means also that the state is sovereign it means the, the citizen electing their representative are sovereign in defining how those religious freedom works. And it is why Ataturk endorsed the term laiklit, laïcité, not to organize uh, the Turkish relation between church and state in the same way than the French, because the, the authority of Turkey, the Turkish authority dis, uh, choose the uh, is uh, the, uh, the religious uh, imams, but it is the affirmation of the sovereignty of the Turkish Republic, like it was in France, the affirmation of the sovereignty on religion of the French Republic against the, Fran uh, against the Pope. So what was the reasoning uh, of the uh, French legislators in matter of penal provision? They would say, Okay, you affirm, for example, in many laws, in many countries, you have the right of property. But if you affirm the right of property without protecting property, your affirmation of right of property is bullshit. So if you affirm the right of conscience, the right to express your face without protecting it, it's bullshit. So uh, connected with the affirmation of these two rights, there is a penal provision in the French law that says, if you pressure somebody to force this person to practice one face or to forbid this person to practice one face, because there is equal treatment between believers and non-believers under the French law, then you can go to jail. You can be condemned by the court uh, to, uh, to jail. There is also in the French law since 1905, the protection of separation. So if you uh, perturbate a religious ceremony, if you de create disorder in religious ceremony, you can be sent to jail by, the, by a judge. But if a cleric of a face from uh, his um, function of cleric uh, attack believers of other faiths or call the believers to go and attack or, or the representative uh, teachers or, uh, uh, or, or call for revolt against other citizens, etc. The clerics can be sent to jail or, to, or, 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 or have a, another penalty uh, less important by the courts. What is very important is that after 1905, just after 1905, the Pope called all the Catholics 
to reject the law of separation and to resist the law of separation. And the government, on the very famous uh, man you might know, Clemenceau, who was the prime minister of France during the First World War, decided to protect the freedom of faith of the Catholic, who were 95% of the population, to keep churches open, to keep bishops and, and, and priests doing their jobs. But when priests, bishops, and even cardinals threaten kids uh, not to give them their, com uh, organize a, a ceremony of communion if they were studying in some books of the public school, or threaten their parents not to get confession or all other religious sacraments if they send their kids to the public school, then these bishops, these cardinals, uh, and these priests were sent to court. They were condemned by the court. And in 1910, a very famous Christian uh, journal uh, uh, no, uh, 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 had the headlines. Last year, there was two big events, uh, the beatification of John of Arc and the condemnation of three bishops by the French court. When the war, after a few years, the, this, I would say, radicalized uh, Catholic bishops and, and priests quieted down. The first war uh, unified the country. And this time of implementation of this penal provision has been since forgotten until I found them last year in the archives and could uh, uh, reinform my country that they have been still in the law. They are still interesting historically. And now the, the, law, has, the law has been revised by the parliament. They have in fact reinforced the, the, the level of the penalty as to implement this provision that has been uh, known and designed in the turning moment of the 19th, uh, 20th century in comparison with Italy, with the US, etc., and are now uh, back uh, uh, to effectivity. So I would like to conclude by saying that I would encourage all of us to do, to continue the work that we have started, but to extend the comparison beyond your continent and to study it uh, in Europe, in the Americas, and to make a big international conference organized by you guys, because you have you have uh, you have, the, have been the pioneers of the renewal of this of these themes, which is so important for mainten for maintaining freedom of of speech, of religion, and peace. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Patrick, and uh, even for the idea of. More conferences in Singapore. I'm all in favor of it. All right. Uh, let me now turn to uh, Jacqueline uh, to give some uh, response to the commentary and add her own uh, thoughts. Jacqueline, please. Thank you, Arif. And thank you to Patrick um, Neville and um, Adrian for your really rich comments. Um, I'm not going to respond fully to um, all your comments, uh, but to sort of the primary takeaway that we, ha uh, we have is obviously that this is an ongoing conversation and a rich area for uh, research. And um, I very much welcome sort of your engagements with some of the ideas and um, to sort of, and also your uh, reflections of uh, how religious offense or uh, religious hatred um, is being addressed in your respective jurisdictions. Um, and I, I sort of wanted to perhaps take this opportunity to uh, sketch out a little bit the approach to this, uh, this, this book. Um, the prim primary approach to this book is a comparative approach. Um, the idea is really that we have a set of very interesting uh, jurisdictions, all of, whom, uh, all of which derive their criminal code from a single source, and yet they have been developed in many different ways. So looking at the single origin and um, considering how, um, if we apply a similar case type of study, why are there different outcomes despite the single origin? And that really was the um, motivating factor for this particular 
um, project. Now, what I'm hearing from all of you really is that um, beyond sort of studying these uh, jurisdictions from the perspective of a comparative uh, law approach from a single origin and looking at possible explanations for differences, we really should also be looking at a functional approach of how to considering how different jurisdictions, even when they do not have a single origin or the way they do not trace their laws from a single origin, really deal with this question, very thorny question of religious speech or speech that um, uh, um, causes some form of religious offense. And in the uh, book, we try to, um, as Adrian has pointed out, um, address some of the conceptual difficulties with this idea of religious offense, also looking at certain legal cognates. So um, one of the big of um, difficulty with studying this area is that there are so many, there's a number of different uh, terms that have been used and they all overlap to some extent. And um, the way in which they are used is not always clear. Um, so do we, um, we sort of talked about blasphemy and to some extent heresy um, and how that has fed into our understanding of these religious penal clauses. But um, at the same time, um, the, the overlap with a more modern conception of um, hate speech, as well as uh, the sort of what has been done at the UN level of uh, using the term defamation of religion, there is a lot of overlap in terms of these different concepts. And it is not always clear as to who or what is the subject of protection and what elements should be um, uh, what elements form the offense, if you like. And so studying religious uh, penal clauses in this particular context is the, the idea is to try to take a little, a small step in, in, in sort of passing through some of these conceptual uh, difficulties or this conceptual um, uh, questions as to exactly what do we mean when we say religious offense, exactly what do we mean when we say blasphemy, exactly what do we mean when we say hate speech or defamation of religion. Um, obviously, you know, um, this is only a first step and what we've done in terms of trying to ident trying to pass through these different concepts by reference to uh, the subject of protection is only one way of doing it. And um, much more could be done in terms of, you know, um, addressing some of these further conceptual questions. But I think, you know, as um, all of you have pointed out to some extent that a functional approach to trying to study how different jurisdictions beyond the common law uh, jurisdictions that were studied um, deal with the um, religious offenses or speech that do cause real offense to certain groups is something that could be further addressed. And what are some of these legitimate limits to free speech, if any? Now, I think sort of the third approach that we touched upon in this book is a cultural approach, which is some attempt, or rather sort of cultural, polit local political approach, which is some attempt to understand the differences by, by reference to the sort of local context, right? Um, I'm a very sort of, I'm, I'm, I'm very much an advocate for trying to understand laws from a cultural and contextual um, approach to try to understand how is it that differences in law arise or developments in law arise and how can this actually be traced back to culture. So this then goes to Adrian's question about, um, uh, about the question of transplantation, which is often to some extent, um, at least in some variants, very much connected to a cultural approach to comparative law. Because um, one of the big questions, of course, you know, there is that the question of is legal transplantation even possible? But I think that's all besides the point. Um, the bigger question, I suppose, is what does it mean to transplant a whole set of laws into a different jurisdiction? And what we have here is fascinating because it is not just a single transplant, it is a transplant that then goes on to different jurisdictions. So um, I very much take Adrian's point about how we could uh, further develop this point about um, what does it say about legal transportation um, and whether this is really just are we taking the same box and then bringing it to different places? 
Um, I think that question is a complex one, which I will need a lot more time to consider, and maybe we can have further conversations about this. But at the very least, what we try to approach, the way we've tried to approach this is to take very seriously the local context, take very seriously the local culture in terms of how these uh, laws have been developed and how they have been used. Um, and as I, I like the way you put it, which is uh, manipulated to uh, for certain elite uh, interests. So sort of, let me just uh, uh, sort of close my comments by sort of saying that um, I think um, beyond the legal transplants question and beyond sort of a further comparative approach that expands beyond um, beyond the uh, common law jurisdictions, uh, there are also sort of um, further areas of research that I could be productive. Uh, one would be the connection between religious off offenses and uh, religious nationalism that we are seeing in you know, increasingly in jurisdictions across the world, but particularly as well in um, in Asia. How is sort of religious uh, these religious how are these religious penal clauses being exploited for nationalist purposes? And how are they actually being further used to further the division between who is part of the religious nation and who is not part of the religious nation? And so the exploit, the, the, the use and abuse of these religious penal clauses also provide an additional legal uh, le soft lever for religious nationalists to um, assert certain sense of religious, um, the, the sense of the religious nation. And the second, I suppose, is also connected to uh, these questions, which is besides religious nationalism, um, is there sort of a populism that is arising that employs these uh, religious penal clauses that requires us to more carefully scrutinize the way in which these laws are being used? And of course, you know, the big uh, one question is what is the difference between religious nationalism and religious populism? Or is there really no such thing as a religious populism um, in terms of how these laws can be used and manipulated to serve for other sort of populist um, agenda across the region and across the world. So just sort of some further areas of research, research that I think could arise from this particular book. And um, I'm really sort of grateful to uh, our commentators for engaging with the book and for your really generous uh, review of the book. Um, I, before I sort of go, I wanted to ask if any of our contributors who are here, uh, Masum, Dian, um, Mario, or I think we lost um, Anne, if you had, if you had some thoughts that you would like to share um, in terms, in response to uh, the comments that have been made. Yes, indeed. Uh, thanks, Jackton. So, Dian, uh, Mario, Masum, any quick comments to make before we turn over to questions? Uh, Arif, if they don't, could I just very briefly respond to Adrian? Uh, uh, Leanne, uh, sure, we'll, we'll, let, we'll let you go first. Editors, okay, this is just, and, then, just, uh, and then we'll go to Dian and, yeah. and others if they have uh, any. Go ahead. Uh, I can't, I can't waste this opportunity. Um, uh, thank you so much, Adrian. That was really thought provoking. And I, I really do like what you had to say about speech being uh, affect. I think the point I was trying to make in, in that chapter was to talk about uh, ration, the enlightenment conception of rationality and how that's fed into the idea of a reasonable man. And as common lawyers, we see the law as regulating reasonable persons. But when it comes to religion, religion is seen you know, not as law's interlocutor, but, you know, it's it's pre-modern other. It seemed to be superstitious and passionate and you can't deliberate or talk to someone who's really religious. I'm not necessarily saying I, I, I agree with this very, uh, very, very stark um, rationality, religion, uh, uh, a dichotomy, I, I tend to see it more along the lines uh, of a spectrum. Uh, I would actually say to, I mean, I do agree with you too, that when it comes to free speech, of course, it can uh, inspire emotions. But I think at least as far as liberal emotion is concerned, to me that, I mean, you can say that, okay, maybe Asians are very religious and care about their faith, they take religion seriously. And, you know, if you're a liberal, you take rights seriously. But what I tried to also point out in my chapter was there is a fear, there is an emotion driving liberal thinking, and that primarily is the emotion, uh, the liberalism of fear, as, as Judith Sklar called it, a fear towards authoritarian rule. 
So in, in that sense, I mean, I, I, I'm pretty new to this whole law and emotions thing. I kind of like stumbled upon it. Uh, I, I got really excited. Uh, but in my that particular chapter, I'm only dealing with the stereotype that, that is embodied in the law. I haven't gone any deeper than that. I probably should. But uh, I just wanted to say thank you for that. And uh, I, I actually think that one could think about the uh, affection towards rights as a kind of secular religion in itself. So, you know, I might want to um, analyze it along those lines. In fact, I'm working on a paper on human rights as secular religion. So you, you kind of got me very excited. So I'm going to, now going to shut up, but thank you so much. Thanks, uh, thanks, Leanne. Um, uh, Mario, uh, uh, Masum, either of you, any comments? Yeah, I just wanted to quickly react to uh, hey. Neville's interesting statement I thought about um, how at the time of Irish independence, uh, there was a strong assertion of the Catholic identity uh, as a reaction to sort of colonial or imperial rule. And in a sense that parallels uh, what has happened in Sri Lanka, where, uh, you know, as a reaction to colonialism, there's been a reassertion of uh, singular Buddhist identity. And in the different constitution making processes the country has gone through, uh, this whole idea of a reassertion of Singhala Buddhist identity has sort of emerged uh, and therefore been captured uh, in, in the constitution, uh, which also in a sense ties in with Jacqueline's point as, as to the way these religious penal clauses uh, have been used uh, to target minorities, uh, especially, uh, especially in the recent past. Uh, so I can only hope like, like Ireland that Sri Lanka might also progress to, uh, to, a, to a situation where uh, there is a larger reliance on, on secular and democratic values. Uh, but I thought that point that Patrick made was quite, uh, uh, that Neville made was quite, uh, quite interesting and parallels uh, some of the developments in Sri Lanka. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks very much. Uh, we, uh, we do have uh, some questions that have come in. Uh, so uh, perhaps we can turn to those since our panelists have been patiently waiting. I have, I have some more questions as well, but I'll, I'll wait until um, we go go to the panelists. So there's one question uh, that says, uh, how do we reconcile, it's coming from uh, Henry Joseph, who's from Sarawak. So the question is, how do we reconcile freedom of speech with the fear of being accused of committing religious offenses? And the example is in the case of Malaysia, where the majority are very sensitive to any speech that touches their religion, even in response to uh, hate speech. Ah, this is uh, the the a tough <laughs> question uh, and if, if we're looking for solutions I have none because I myself um, have been grappling uh, with this so I suppose you know at the end of the day it depends on to some extent and and this has kind of animated some of, of, of the discussions uh, today the values that the country or the courts or the political actors want to prioritize, right? So do you prioritize um, the value of uh, public order? And sometimes public order is conceptualized as not uh, protecting the majority from being offended. I think there's a real problem with that. Or do you prioritize the value of uh, 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 free speech? and um, you know, in a way, healthy uh, exchange of ideas in, in a maturing or a mature democracy. I think uh, the problem in Malaysia is that because of the political contexts and exigencies, the trend shows that the value that has been prioritized, as I said, is public order, but public order from the perspective of not protecting or, or rather of protecting majority sensitivities, because the idea is that if the majority is triggered and they get very offended, then they will go out and we'll have another, uh, you know, uh, uh, episode of, of racial riots like, like uh, those in, in 1969. Uh, but as I said, I have no concrete solution <laughs> for that, except to say that, that how, how we uh, uh, choose our values has, has to change. And it, We'll have to start with with the political actors and those speaking decisions in in their respect. Jacqueline, right. Just to supplement, I think something very interesting about Malaysia is the fact that you actually have a dual regime, right? So religious uh, penal clauses are typically used against uh, non-Muslims, 
whereas you actually have a Sharia regime that is a state for uh, um, there are um, within state enactments uh, in the federal state, which are then applied against the Muslims. So within these state Sharia enactments, you have uh, provisions such as insulting Islam as a uh, criminal offense. Um, and sort of uh, similar stuff. So what is interesting in Malaysia, I think that um, serve, uh, serves a sort of a divide and conquer type of uh, dynamics is that the non-Muslims are subject to the penal code primarily, uh, the religious penal clauses are being used against them, whereas the um, Muslims uh, tend to be, not, all, not entirely, but tend to be subject to the uh, insulting of Islam type provisions within the Sharia codes. And I think what is needed in Malaysia is an attempt to try to sort of connect these two, which means that most non-Muslims have to care more about when Muslims are being uh, um, uh, prosecuted under these insulting Islam provisions under the Sharia code. And, uh, bec and because these are primarily Muslim minorities who are being or Muslim dissidents who are being um, uh, penalized under these Sharia codes, and Muslims then have to also care more about non-Muslims being subject to these religious penal clauses, typically under conditions that can be quite problematic. So I'm not saying that they. Um, so I'm not saying that uh, Muslims are not subject to those clauses, but I think there's and there there needs to be sort of closer contact in terms of these. Uh, we need to marry these two. Uh, the dual system in such a way that um, it's uh, that that this division I think needs to be soft. The gap between these two uh, communities need to be uh, further bridged in terms of ensuring that freedom of speech is um, protected for all communities in Malaysia. Thanks, Jack. And Jan, I think you said you had a quick follow up that you wanted to. Yes, and, and I'm really glad, uh, Jacqueline, thank you for bringing up um, the, the, the kind of two ways we can, we can look at this, because um, I, I know I said earlier that public order is, is conceived from the perspective of the majority, right, how to protect the majority from being offended. But also in many cases, when Muslims have been prosecuted under the various Sharia offences uh, or, or clauses dealing with religious offence, uh, these have been tied to uh, public order in the sense of protecting state, religious state institutions. So you can't say, for instance, or you can't criticize religious state institutions because that would be seen as blaspheming Islam or offending the Islamic religion. So these institutions are almost like they're the religion uh, uh, you know, itself. Uh, and, and that, I think, is also uh, an issue that, that's worth addressing uh, going forward. Great, thank you. Yeah, there's one other question in the in the chat, so I'll I'll take that and then um, and then maybe see if there are other questions that come up. Um, so, Liam, this is this is a bit of a toughie, so I'm going to give it to you uh, because it's a question that I think is asking. You know, when you're talking about religious offenses, of course, that begs the question of what you know, what is religion and how do one how does one define religion? And really the question is saying, how, how do you differentiate religion from a cult uh, that is uh, perhaps against mainstream worship for the, I guess, for, for the context of um, uh, uh, religious offenses? Uh, actually, um, this is a deeply theological question, but practically it's actually resolved by power. Whoever's in power is going to say, you know, you're, I'm mainstream, you're a cult, therefore you don't get protected. It's kind of unfortunate, but uh, this this really I mean, I mean, you've done the whole other thing on regulating religion, right? So the the whole point we can't even get to first base on what we define religion to be. So ultimately, it's not. I think it's entirely sorted out by power politics. Okay, thank you. Um, and Masum, not not to put you on the spot too much, but you know the question that was raised in the context of Malaysia. Uh, is it also a question that could be raised in the context of Bangladesh? And could you could you speak to that about uh, you know uh, sensitivities that might come in China? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. The situation in Bangladesh is no different than that of Malaysia because the question of uh, uh, diarchy that uh, Professor uh, Jacqueline also was referring to 
is prevailing in Bangladesh. For Bangladesh, the question is again the dilemma between secularism and uh, uh, the question of a state religion, because uh, uh, we have uh, said in our constitution that Islam is the state religion. At the same time, we have also restored principle of secularism in the constitution, which was actually inserted in our constitution when it was made in 1972. In fact, uh, in our society, we have this cultural ability to resist uh, uh, enacting any blasphemy law in the in in the in the extreme sense of the term, but nonetheless, uh, there has been really a transformation and shift in the society, particularly in the recent past. And also, uh, when the technology and the social network uh, has been very uh, pivotal in making communication within a fraction of seconds, and if somebody says this or that. Ultimately, it is being, you know, relayed to the whole society and the whole of Bangladesh crores of people are being stuck to that. For example, the recent India incident on the on the Borka, the girl protesting uh, to right to wear the Borka also overshadowed the Bangladeshi political and, you know, uh, religious debate. Whatever has been uh, portraying in the society is being interpreted in the light of religiosity. And therefore, we are being confused what should really be the real uh, uh, characteristic of the secularity, whether it, uh, we, should, we should find a point of intersection or we should go and prepare uh, uh, the, people among, uh, the people to accept more, uh, to be more tolerant to the, uh, to the opposite views. But I see no point of you know, uh, uh, hope. Uh, because it is it is being increasingly radicalized. So, so the challenge, we, we have this, you know, uh, law, uh, penal code enacted by the, uh, by the British regime. But we, we, the last amendment we made in 1927, but thing is we have made new, uh, new, new penal law in 2018 where the Digital Security Act has taken about, you cannot speak actually which offenses other, which offends others' religious feelings. Once again, these feelings, this religious sentiment has not been defined in the court. So it is being widely interpreted. Importantly, the judiciary has not been sensitized to that respect. So the, uh, the omni uh, present media and social media, and as well as the misinformation and disinformation defined by the political hegemony has, uh, I, I mean, uh, deteriorated the situation. The challenge is there. The constitution is not helping. The judges are not giving liberal interpretation. So we are also facing this kind of challenges. I don't know. There is no solution in my hand, but thanks for the question. Great. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, there are no other questions in, in the chat. Uh, perhaps I could, I could pose one question and then see if uh, any of the, the panelists have other uh, points that they want to make. And actually, this is a question that I might direct a little bit, um, well, to Neville, to Adrian, and, and to Patrick. Uh, but it comes out perhaps particularly from uh, Neville, your presentation, and Patrick, your presentation. Um, and that is about, uh, if, I, if I understood correctly, you know, in both cases, you're talking about a sort of a change in the political culture of your countries, which has sort of changed the understanding of uh, blasphemy laws or religious offenses, if we're going to call it uh, that. Um, and I'm wondering whether or not now, uh, as some people to say, you know, in certain parts, we are dealing in post-religious societies. And it is just that shift to these post-religious societies that mean that these things are simply not important, simply not relevant um, in, in the contexts of Western Europe, or indeed perhaps also in the context of Australia. Uh, so could I ask for your thoughts on that, please? Well, okay, so if I was to go first, I, I thought, uh, you know, I can't remember who said it, but the really illuminating idea of sort of human rights language just being a sort of non-religious or a secular religion. Um, I think all societies need clear moral north stars uh, where they will gain their laws. I don't think necessarily the content 
of what's at stake matters as much as the fact that there is some clear moral agreement uh, from which people can can discern their their um, answers to questions of right and wrong. Uh, so from Ireland's perspective, and I think it would probably be the same with France, except that it's, uh, Ireland kind of went uh, 200 years later. Uh, um, from Ireland's perspective, uh, I think that what's interesting is the, the kind of passion with which people um, go along with the dominant moral norm, especially when it's vaguely revolutionary. So back in the mid 20th century, the Irish people emphatically and very um, wholeheartedly uh, to a large extent endorsed specific aspects of Roman Catholic doctrine, uh, whether it's opposition to abortion or divorce or contraception, but or indeed in terms of attitudes to women and so forth and so on. But they now, following the sort of cultural or moral revolution, they now equally emphatically endorse uh, liberal secular values, very often intentionally as a matter of opposition to Roman Catholic teaching. So Ireland was, for instance, the first country in the world to um, legalise same-sex marriage by way of a popular referendum um, and so forth. Um, to me, it's simply saying we now have a different moral North Star, but we're going to endorse it absolutely wholeheartedly. Uh, I, I want, could I make one very brief point about the, uh, just in relation to uh, the gentleman from Sri Lanka uh, and, and the comments on Ireland's blasphemy law, what's really interesting is that this did come in as a matter of assertive uh, Irish uh, Roman Catholic nationalism, but the law was in fact based on the Irish blasphemy law, which was, as say, almost quasi-revolutionary when it came in because it was uh, focusing on Roman Catholic confessionalism, but it was based on the British common law of blasphemy, common law offensive blasphemy, which had been brought in as a, as a result of moral imperialism uh, by the British establishment. So it comes this strange circularity there. Thank you. Uh, Patrick, any comments and then Adrian? Yes, I, I would say that uh, when we think about designing this provision in the law, we have to think about all situations and all individuals of all faiths, of no faith, of equal, uh, thinking about equality between all individuals. And, the, and, the, and that is, for example, in my country in 1905, there are Muslims, three million Muslims living in Algeria under a regime of discrimination, of colonial discrimination. And the parliament discuss, should the law apply to Algeria? And they say, yes, they vote on that particular issue and they give the government a time of you know, transitional period for uh, implementing the law in Algeria. And the government used this provision to keep the transition forever until independence of Algeria. But what is important for now in my country is that when they designed the law, they didn't say it's for Christian or it's for only the, 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 the face where we are in central France, where you had 99% Christian and 1% Jews, it's for all faiths. And it's why, because it was also for Muslim, it was also for Buddhist, etc., and for non-believers. So that's, that's, the, that's the way, and, but it is important to keep this provision because you, you never know from where attacks can come, can come from non-believers towards believers, from believers to, to other believers, to, from believers to, so I think that's the way to think about these provisions that are necessary to implement to keep protection on the freedom we all want to protect. Thank you. Um, Adrian, I'll, I'll, I'll invite you if you have any comments on this, but although there's another question that has come in um, that talks about uh, the discussion you were having with Leanne, and it's a question from, uh, from Gary Lee of CALS. Uh, that question is, regarding the significance of emotions in law and arguing, or the question says, if we turn to the tradition of Durkheimian sociology, might we say that modern collective sentiments tend to regard the individual and their rights as sacred and inviolable? And if that is the case, does liberalism go beyond 
a fear of the state. So I don't know if you wanted to say something on the question that I posed about, uh, you know, post-religious context of Australia or to address uh, this question. Well, let me just say very briefly that Australia is um, probably a place that might have conceived of itself as fairly secular and possible demographic trends indicate that they're in fact this is so um let me just say that there um can you hear me Arif? because my yes it, it, it was breaking up a little bit it sort of comes in and out we, i think we can hear you now okay um i think i agree uh with the question uh from gary lee uh that i think that within very traditional liberal conceptions well, within bodies of jurisprudence that regard themselves as motivated by traditional liberal conceptions of rights, that you can see both appeals to emotion and to um, uh, other non-rational values. And that um, I think that this, that liberalism can accommodate a conception of rights that is valued for more than their kind of um, appeal uh, to the rational, very much so. And I think, in fact, freedom of speech is a good example of that. And if you look at the law of the First Amendment, for instance, it is notably defined by um, appeals to emotion at the same time as usually being regarded as very solidly liberal. Thank you. Um, there is a, one, one other question that's come in the chat and then we'll see if there are others that get floated. It's, it's using um, the language of the margin of appreciation that is, you know, may, appears in EU law. And the question is, to what extent can we, the margin of appreciation idea be exercised by states in regulating religion or in enacting religious offenses? Any volunteers to talk about margin of appreciation and religious offenses? But I briefly, um, because, <clears throat> so I think that from the European Court of Human Rights perspective, when it applies margin of appreciation doctrine, <clears throat> especially in the context of uh, religious offences or religious freedom, what it's saying is <clears throat> quite simply, it wants nothing to do with anything to do with religion insofar as states are concerned. It's basically a def um, an excuse for it to vacate the playing field while pretending that it continues to have authority uh, in respect of religious freedom. Um, insofar as the state is concerned, uh, I'm not quite. I'm not clear that in fact margin of appreciation is something which is likely to happen if we're dealing with something which is absolutely essential to a nation's public morality. Because I think the state would take the view that it's laying down symbolic lines in the sand and no one should cross it. Thank you, uh, Patrick. Anything further on margin of appreciation from the perspective of France, or no? <laughs> Margin of appreciation? Yes. The, the question was whether margin of appreciation doctrine could be used in regulating religion or in dealing with religious offenses. Of course, because when you go to the court, a judge has always margin of appreciation. And it is how it has... What is very bad is when it is regulated by the government. And yeah. in fact, historically, it's good for the government to, go, to, to send the cases to the courts because then they say, okay, you have this problem. We don't decide, the court decides. And the court, as you know, can have a change of jurisprudence, et cetera, and you can, you can transfer the conflict to the courts. It's much better. Fair enough, okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, uh, I don't know if there are any, uh, comments or other comments that any of the panelists want to make now. Uh, if, if not, there is one question that I would like to um, raise. Um, and that it, it, is, it comes back to this question about um, context. And in particular, it is a question about, uh, you know, we're talking about the transplantation and the Macaulay code and, and we talked about how, you know, uh, and Neville, you had mentioned this, you know, it may have come from the Anglican idea and it's a, that was a 
bit of a bad fit uh, for Ireland as being majority Catholic, but it also has come, it seems to me, from notions uh, where you could have ideas of orthodoxy and heterodoxy that were linked to churches that were able to define the orthodox and heterodox. And when you're dealing in Asia, it seems to me that you're dealing with contexts which haven't had that same sort of structure. Um, Diane May, in her comments said, you know, these, these institutions of uh, Islam in Malaysia are now being treated as defining Islam, but of course there's not been a church in the same way. The same might apply to Hinduism and Buddhism. It's just not had that. And therefore things like blasphemy have seen uh, can be kind of odd fits for that. So I'm wondering whether or not um, either uh, Jacqueline or, or Leanne, uh, you know, put, put the Asia hat on, think that there is something to the different contextual frame uh, in Asia that we need to think about uh, when we compare it to other parts of the world. Uh, Jacqueline, do you have any comments? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I think that's a fantastic question. The question of, you know, um, this goes back to um, Adrian's um, question earlier about legal transplants. And I think that um, there are at least, and sort of, you know, the question of trying to bring a sort of Christian centric or a law that was developed within a certain Judeo Christian frame and then transplanting it into um, a jurisdiction that does not necessarily have the same forms of religious hierarchy, the same forms of religious um, um, institutional structure, as well as the same forms of sort of um, religious tradition that's very much uh, centered around a particular a set of texts, right? So I think in so far as the, uh, when we talk about the different religious uh, groups in, in, in Asia, um, Islam would be, would have sort of somewhat more, uh, a closer relationship to some of these central ideas except for the institutional part, right? So at the very least, you have a, Islam has a set of texts that could be used to um, base certain ideas of orthodoxy. But then that also sort of often obscures, or I think in your chapter, you talk about flattening out some of these uh, traditional diversity uh, because within Islam, Islam itself is not a homogenous tradition. And so um, the, the, what, what we have seen in these different jurisdictions is that the institutional structure that was represented by say the church is now taken over by the state. And I think that really is where some of these issues um, arise because who is defining what is a cult? Who is saying this is insulting to Islam? It's not the necessarily a set of um, you know, uh, religious institution, but it's actually a set of religious institution that is backed by the state. So really what we're seeing is that the institutional structure that perhaps made sense um, where you have church and state in somewhat of um, competition as well as in coexistence, um, creating some level of, um, I suppose, uh, check and balance to some extent, does not really exist in many of these jurisdictions that we see within Asia. And so you really have the state playing the role of both um, arbiter of state doctrine as well as arbiter of religious doctrine. And I suppose that really, um, many of the questions and issues that we've been seeing is, uh, I think core to um, the politicization of religious uh, penal clauses in, um, in Asia. Now that's sort of one set of, um, of, of, uh, of issues that arise from uh, where you have Islam as the dominant religion taken over by the state. Of course, you know, some may, uh, we, if we sort of look at other jurisdictions where it is not a Muslim majority state, but um, sort of maybe a Buddhist majority state or a, uh, Hindu majority state, despite the lack of, you know, some of these parallels with, in terms of um, having a specific text that you can ground orthodoxy in, there is actually, at least, you know, uh, if we see in terms of uh, how Hinduism is being developed by the courts, there is this recreation of a modern Hinduism that is very much um, built around this idea of there being a certain essential doctrine. So I think this is where the essential practice test come in, uh, in, in India, which, which is being used to identify what is 
essential and what is not. And um, I think as Rona Joyson and others have sort of pointed out, they, they are being, it is a test that is being used to also advance a particular modern concept of Hinduism that then, you know, is being used to sort of define what is religious and what is not, what is offensive and what is not. So the, it is being used to draw lines, draw dividing lines between what is acceptable and what is not. Thanks very much, Jacqueline. Um, we are technically uh, sort of out of time and slightly over time. Um, so perhaps I should call proceedings to an end, but uh, thank you uh, again to all of the panelists. Thank you, uh, Jacqueline and Leanne for giving us the book once again, and thank you to all the participants and to CALS for organizing this. Thank you everyone.